I can't sleep when I lay in bed Too much thinking in my head I don't know what to do anymore But come on now, tell me the score Is there anything I can do To get out of these tragic blues I'm a victim of circumstance I never really had a chance I lay down and stare at my feet you know the world is God to be. Welcome to today's edition of Mental Health Matters. Today we're going to be talking about 100 black men. We're going to focus on the mental health aspect of African American community, the stigma that's attached to uh, black men, and much more. Welcome to our show. Um, we're going to start off, I want to have everybody to just introduce themselves and just kind of talk about um, what you do and your um, role um, at, at, at your job you're at, or if you're just out in the community, just you know, providing volunteer services, just kind of talk about what you do. Mm -hmm. We can start with you, James. Uh, yes, my name is James Earl Hall. I'm a retired uh, individual. I <laughs> am a, I'm the chairman of the Health and Wellness Committee for the 100 Black Men of Sacramento Incorporated. And my duties there is to attend uh, health fairs and to uh, exhibit health fairs. Uh, I really like to point out that prostate cancer and uh, diabetes is one of the two things that we push at the 100 because myself, I'm a cancer survivor, a prostate cancer survivor of seven years and uh, I'm just happy it's, it's gone, the cancer is gone and I tell everyone that I come in contact with, please get your PSA checked. You know, make, if you don't feel well, go get checked out. So. We really push health and all cancer. Uh, we have a cancer uh, uh, fair in October for the last seven years at the Oak Park Community Center. Uh, we have uh, other uh, uh, agencies. We work closely with uh, Kaiser uh, and Rancho Cordova, Dr. Uh, Daryl Hunter. We all we put on health fairs at the Oak Park Community Center. We just want to be active in the community and let them know that we're there and we want to get the health message out to them. When they can't afford it, we will help them uh, uh, attain okay. health care. Thank you. Hey, my name is Eugene Willis, and thank you for having me today. I've been working in the community for about 10 years in various capacities, first as a drug and alcohol counselor, uh, working with meth court and drug court, working with addicts who had dual diagnosis, meaning they had a mental health and substance addiction. So that was an interesting field. I did that for approximately two and a half years and worked with various nonprofit organizations from nice. NAMI. Uh, recently, I was a board member for NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness. And I worked in that, I was a board member for approximately a year and a half. Currently, I'm a board member for 100 Black Men of Sacramento and a board member for Greater Sacramento Urban League Young Professionals. So under those capacities, we push a wide range of different things. So mental health is a critical thing in our communities. So Part of the 100 Black Men's mission is to do mentoring and tutoring. So consistent with that, providing knowledge about mental illness, the impact that can have on education, impact that can have on your lives with the criminal justice system. So it's a critical issue that a lot of people don't address. So it's obvious when you see a physical ailment yes. that that's identifiable. So there's a big stigma attached to having a mental illness. So a lot of people aren't addressing that. So. Our mission is to try to eradicate stigma, reduce, um, you know, just all the, the symptoms and issues related to that. So uh, I'm glad to be here today. So have a nice discussion. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Ramsey. Hello. Good evening. My name is Ramsey Franklin. I work for Nor NorCal Mental Health America, particularly the SAFE program. My duties as a youth advocate, I work really closely and directly with the youth who have been stigmatized by mental health and all of the things that coincide with that. So as a youth advocate, my uh, main priority and main goal is to help uh, youth and children navigate the mental health system and help them connect them to the resources that they need to better themselves, whether it's in education, uh, social, academic, uh, and just personally. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Joseph Deere. 
Uh, I'm a counselor educator at uh, California State University, Sacramento. Uh, I recent reti recently retired from the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, where I was uh, a consultant uh, covering uh, mental health and basically doing research on how to help the schools deal with mental health in a more practical way. Uh, I've been a uh, part-time faculty at uh, California State University, Sacramento, training school counselors, career counselors, mar marriage family therapists, uh, and uh, I did that from 1976 to 1979. Uh, and I left there, uh, but now I'm back and have been back for the last six years uh, as a counselor educator. Right, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for um, a really, really good introduction. So I, I want to start off by kind of talking about um, the 100 Black Men Organization. And could you kind of tell us what type of services that they actually provide um, to the community? Well, we were a nonprofit organization, so our mission is to tutor young men, okay. provide them an example that they can follow, a positive example. So a lot of times that's being a resource. So uh, as a counselor, one of your biggest things is try to listen and provide uh, information to the extent you, you can. Um, and so our mission is to go out in the community, be active, show them a positive example, provide them with the resources that are in the community, Mental Health of America, SAMHSA resources, NAMI, there's a, there's a wide variety of different resources. So I think for us, consistency is one of those things we have as part of our organization, pursuing grants, pursuing different avenues for funding to be active in the community and provide them resources. So we have a health and wellness committee and we focus on physical things, but with the emergence of mental health becoming a big thing in yeah. the community, we felt that it was necessary to ramp up our efforts in terms of mental health and we've been a part of different uh, mental health workshops and trainings and different things like that so mental illness you see the suicide rate among young black men is increasing virtually every year so that's something that they're not a lot of times they don't have a positive influence from a male perspective in the house to kind of balance those needs you know they have with their mother or female influences so we just think it's critical for part of our mission to be consistent mentors for them in whatever capacity we can. So that's that's one of our biggest missions is consistency, providing the resources and providing the avenue for them to have success in school because it translates to your education, to your ability to keep a job and, yes. and various things. So mental illness, it has to be addressed and the access to health care is another thing. So there's there's a lot of different issues and so we just consistency would be our biggest Okay, and so how, how are you guys funded? We're primarily funded through donations. We do various events. We have a white linen affair. We have a Christmas gala. Okay. We have donations from sponsors, just regular members of the community. So we use that, but there's never enough resources that you can get. So that's why we're trying to pursue grants as an avenue to increase our fundraising efforts. So. You know, the more money we can get, we can show the impact that the 100 black men can have on the community. Yeah. Just being there and being available and being that resource to say, hey, there's members, there's 100 black men members who've dealt with depression, or dealt with yeah. bipolar, or have family members. Yeah. So just so that we can show them, hey, we look like we're in a good position now, but we've dealt with depression and there's nothing wrong with being open and discussing that and pursuing help yeah, I think so. I think that's the biggest thing is a lot of times there's there's kind of a there's kind of the culture of being a machismo culture in terms of I got to be strong. I can't show any weakness. I can't show any fear. Yeah, and that's part of the problem. If you're dealing with issues and you don't get help, then yeah, it's gonna it's gonna affect every area of your life. So mm -hmm. grants is one of our biggest things. So we're just we're pursuing a number of different grants right now, and we hope to use those resources to go out, provide literature, provide different events they can go to and just be that be that rock for them. Yeah. Well, um, I kind of want to pick it back on um, a comment you made because you had communicated that um, about not having um, a, a positive role model male um, in the home. 
and I kind of want to get everybody um, um, opinion about this. How important is it to have a um, for African American young men? How important is it to have a positive black man, or a father figure, or a mentor, a role model that's involved not only in the home but just involved in their life overall? From from a personal perspective, I think my dad was in and out of my life various times until I was eight or nine years old, but he instilled a lot of values in me at an early age that even though he wasn't there during the four other formative years, I still held true to that in terms of working hard, mm -hmm. thinking, um, and just having accountability for your actions. So, you know, clearly a lot of young men don't have a father figure in their home or positive male influence, so they don't know how to ask for help. They don't know how to pursue getting a college degree or how yeah. to fill out applications or things that many people might think are basic. Yeah. But if you haven't seen anyone do those particular things and your role models are involved in, in maybe drug dealing or some non-positive things, that's all you know and that's all you see. So your environment can shape you. So a yeah. lot of times people are product of their environment. Exactly. Coupled exactly. with maybe not having financial resources, coupled with seeing violence, seeing easy money you can make through drugs or, or various other criminal transactions. So I think for us, we, we try to show them the good and bad that, hey, so a lot of our members have college degrees, have great jobs, are yes. making good money, but there was, that was a process. And yeah. a lot of times we, we try to show them, hey, we made plenty of mistakes. Yeah. We oh, may yeah. have engaged in activities yeah. that, that aren't, aren't positive, but yeah. we learn from those experiences and say, hey, we, there's good and bad. So yeah. even if you make a mistake, you can still overcome that and do better. Yeah. And as long as you work hard, you learn from those mistakes, I think. So just showing the good and bad is yeah. what we try to instill it in the, in the young man that we deal with. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So James, why do you think it's important for um, an African-American male to have some involvement with uh, their father or their mentor or a role model that can um, display positive influence in their lives? Well, Jesse, I, I, I feel that it's very important. I am a product of a father and mother, uh, two family, uh, two uh, parents in the home, and that's not the case today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we uh, wrestle with that uh, the, at the 100 because we realize that the single family home, the mother is taking the kid to school and dropping them off and hoping that they raise their child. Mm -hmm. And that has to stop. And we, uh, we, we really push the idea that what they see is what they'll be. And when we come into their lives, we want to be a positive role model mm -hmm. for that young man or that, that young girl and to let them see us and you know take them places or just be in their company and, and encourage them yeah. and let them know that they can make it. Yeah. Uh, we're here for you. Yes. Too many uh, men don't tell younger uh, siblings or younger uh, individuals that you're going to be okay. It's yeah. going to be fine. Why don't you come just call me. Here's my email. Here's my contact number. Uh, too many um, men today just they don't even smile at children today but we we focus on greeting them and saying hello how you doing young man young lady how are you yeah they don't get that and that's it's the little things that they need i got that you know from yeah. my mother and father but i was fortunate enough to have them in my life you know up until uh some time ago but still to have i i, I find it that I, I was blessed to have them there because i look at those individuals that don't have a mother and father and how they turned out and and that's a big difference i mean you can see the difference your environment has on you yes. you don't realize it until you get out there in the world and say hmm i wouldn't do that you know so and so is doing it this way that's yeah. not the way to do it. but i i was raised better than that i try to share that even you know in my attitude uh when i go when we mentor and uh uh, my heart goes out to the, the young ones. If, if something's wrong with their dress, I say, well, what's wrong with your shoes? You don't have any shoes? I'll, I'll get them a pair of tennis shoes. Yeah. And but that's what we do. We volunteer. We donate. We don't. Yes, we want grants and everything, but it's okay to go into your pocket and say, Absolutely. You know, you, I'm going to get you some shoes, you know, yeah. just tennis shoes, because what you're wearing is, you know, and it's okay to do that. Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a grown up. And, and I'm an African-American man, and 
you should have this. And, and there's no man, no, no father figure, no male role model in your life. So, you know, I don't say all this, but I just do it. You know, yeah. just doing, you don't have to brag about it, just do it. And yeah. that's what we do. We show them love and we encourage them. And we let them know that there are uh, opportunities out there for them. Yeah. And we can show them the way, uh, like Eugene was saying, I mean, we show them opportunities that we provide. And we do follow up on it. Yeah. We, if we take a charge, we go as far as, uh, as, as allowable. You know, we uh, go far and beyond. We do, as, we do all that we can do. So it's 30 years strong, the 100 Black Men of Sacramento Incorporated. We've been in the city, it's 30 years this year. And uh, men like Eugene are coming along, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm retired from the state, I worked in health professions, giving scholarships to individuals that were willing to work in the health profession for two years in a diverse area. And that was the best, uh, uh, career I had. I mean, I worked for the state for quite some years, but with fishing game, it was a little different yeah. doing inventory, but working with individuals that wanted to be in the health profession, I, that was gratifying. Yeah. And when I retired, I went into the, with the 100 black men and, and these guys were doing something that I wanted to do. Yes. And I, for the last seven, going on eight years, I've been working in the health and wellness committee, and now I'm the uh, chairman of that committee. And we're doing great things. We're touching lives. Uh, Sacramento Association of Black Nurses, we partner with them. You know, they help when we have screenings for uh, prostate and blood pressure screenings and diabetes. They, we, you know, we partner with them at our events because we want the public to see, you know, that we work in, you know, hand in hand yes. with uh, other uh, uh, minorities that are working to reach out and touch the community and let them know that, yeah, you can make it, I'm here. Yeah. And it's like, oh, are you the help? No, I am the man. Yeah. I am the head nurse. I yeah. am, you know. Yes. And you can be also. So yeah. what you see is is what you'll be. And we want to, we try to press that as often as possible. Okay. <laughs> I like that. What about you, uh, Joe? Uh, well, I think they've said a lot okay. uh, in terms of the environment being the, the critical piece. Yeah. Uh, we are all a product of our environment. Yes. And when we talk about environment, oftentimes we're thinking of, of the home, mm -hmm. but it's not just the home. Mm -hmm. I mean, most kids don't spend a whole lot of time at home. They spend time at school. Mm -hmm. uh, they spend time with their friends. So the environment that they're in, uh, in those other places, including the home, is they need to see examples mm -hmm. uh, of what other people are doing that's good, that can be attractive to them, yeah. and that they're willing to do and try to do. Yeah. So the more they see that, the more likely they'll do that. Yeah. And uh, it's good to tell them things or good for them to read things, but nothing beats uh, uh, an example yeah. of uh, especially a person that they respect or they like, uh, but especially the, f the family is probably the primary source. But the environment, absolutely no question, is the, 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 the key. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Amazing? Well, I mean, it's pretty much what all three of these men have said. They yeah. put it well put. Um, it's crucial to the mind, the body, and the soul, as I believe, because without a male figure, without a positive role model, it's like, who can you go to? To, um, to learn these things from, who can yeah. you go to uh, to tell you what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. Um, so the positivity is crucial for the development of any child, uh, whether it's African American, whether it's Latino, whether it's Asian or whether it's American. It's crucial and it's needed and it's sad to see that a lot of these homes now don't have the positive figures in their life because their mother is working all day and all night. So in, in so many words for men specifically, uh, only a man, man can teach a man how to be a man. That's right. <laughs> so it, it's crucial. I mean, it, it's well put. You know, that's yeah. pretty much all I can say about that. No, oh, and I think for me personally, just to sum up what everybody said, I think that um, I do agree with everybody saying. My personal experience, um, I didn't have the uh, experience to have my father involved in my life the way that he needed to be. Um, when he came around, um, a lot of time he came around, he, at my younger years, he came around, he was very physically abusive to my mom. 
um, you know, he would come around, you know, and just give us money, uh, and then he would leave, you know. We knew where to go and find him at, you know, but he was not involved the way we needed for him to be. Um, you know, and that really affected uh, my mental health um, in a very, very, very um, um, negative way. A lot of people in my family don't even know this to this day. I, I became, I was very depressed as a child. And because of depression, I tended to act out a lot, meaning I, I you know, would act out uh, very playful and just because I want to cover up my depression. Mm -hmm. I did have thoughts of suicide. Um, nobody never knew about that. But I always wonder, like, why was my father not involved in my life the way that I needed him to be? You know, um, I'm thankful for my mom. You know, um, there was a lot of issues going on with her. Um, she drank a lot, and, and I understand why she drank a lot, because she had, she was raising three boys and two girls on her own, you know, um, and she did the best she knew how to do, and I commend her for that. She could have gave herself for adoption, but she didn't, and she stuck in there, and she did what she had to do the best way she knew how as a parent, you know, and so through the years, I had a lot of um, hatred in my heart for my father, because I, I didn't understand why he wasn't there. I needed him present in my life um, in, in a very, very, very um, strong way. I, one of my brothers um, had joined the gang. He was um, killed, you know, um, and so inwardly I blamed that on my father. Um, so there's a lot of things that he missed out on you know, in our lives, you know, me graduating from college, me going to college and, you know, different things. And, and those are things that he could never get back. But, you know, today we have a really good relationship, you know, and just me talking to him and getting a chance to really know him a little bit better. He didn't know how to be a good father because of what was going on in his upbringing. You know, so it, it's, it was generational. And because of that, I have, um, you know, a sibling or two who are not good fathers because of the result of that, you know? And so it's important that we have these uh, male role models in our lives to help shape us. So I thank God that I was able to, um, you know, I kind of steered off in the wrong direction, you know, but I'm grateful that I got back on track and was able to move forth in a, in a positive way. And I, I just want to throw this out there, too, and, and just get you guys input. How, how does that in, uh, affect a person's mental health? Like, have you guys experienced, like, um, some of the youth or just throughout the years of dealing with um, just young men? How, how do you see that really affect their mental health by not having somebody in their life that they can count on, that they can trust, that they can depend on? How, do, how does that really affect them? Because like you said, um, Eugene, we, we put up this, this image like we got to be strong and, yes. you know, we can't let nobody see us cry. But in inwardly, we're, we're shattered. You know, so how, how does that affect us and what can we do as a, as a community, that's about the African American community, what can we do as an African American community to, to, um, to do away with that? You know, what, what, what do you guys think we can, what can we do? Well, I would say you just, you just said it, community, that's what okay. we need. We need to uh, become as one and really uh, look out for one another. You know, it just doesn't have to be the father. If you see somebody's at home and they're not, they don't have that positive male figure in their life, then step up and be that positive male figure. That's, that's pretty much to sum it all up, in my opinion, is we need that sense of community because it's, it's separated. It's been separated for decades. Yeah. Um, and so if we can get that back, then we'll realize that as one, we are stronger as opposed to being separated. So that's my opinion or my, my intake on that. Okay. I, I can uh, we'll come in on this one. <clears throat> It's, it's a progressive process. Right. Um, you know, as you grow older, you learn more. That's right. And as you learn more, you build and build on, on those things. And depending on how far gone or how far off they are, then that'll depend on how much they need. Yeah. Uh, so if we have a six-year-old or eight-year-old who is uh, not doing well, then they need probably a parent more than anything because they're mm -hmm. in touch with the parent or the school mm -hmm. to try to help them to, to, to build a positive uh, outcome that can help them to see 
positive things that they can then emulate or, or, or try to follow. Yeah. As they grow older, they need to grow from what they learned younger mm -hmm. and add to that. So it's really a progressive thing. Uh, and as you were mentioning, it, it, it does take a family mm -hmm. or a community. community yes. Mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as has been said, it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And in the sense of a village, that village is whoever that person come in contact with. Yes. The influence that they have uh, throughout the day, in the 24-hour day, that's the village. Mm -hmm. And if, that, if the individuals within that village can be a positive influence, then of course, yeah. that's what they see, so that's what they will eventually become and gradually, hopefully, yeah. again, uh, keep those positive uh, influences and, and become a positive influence themselves. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do, because um, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit, because I want to try to cover a lot with, mm -hmm. with just a little bit of time. Okay. So wh wh why do you guys think that there's so much um, black on black crime? You know, we hear what's going on um, in the news um, in Chicago, Illinois. There's a lot of, um, and even when I was living there and growing up, it was still a lot of gang wars. You know, my, as I said, my brother, he was killed, um, you know, due to gang violence and stuff like that. So w why do you guys think a lot of that um, is going on still today after so many years? I think it's a systemic issue. There's obviously, I think, I think I saw President Obama last week, he hit on it, the disparity in terms of arrests for young black men and young Latino men in terms of people arrested for, compared to whites, for significantly more African Americans arrested mm -hmm. for the same crimes. Yeah. They're not giving given the option for rehabilitation services as much, yeah. and the disparity is, is pretty significant. So when you look at that, if you are arrested, you're immediately attached, mm -hmm. the stigma is attached to that. So yeah. if you sold drugs or anything like that, and then you become a hardened criminal, you go back home with no opportunity to get a job, mm -hmm. you're gonna resort to criminal activities yeah. to, to, to feed your family. So yeah. there's not a lot of options there. So I guess to kind of underscore what Ramsey was saying in terms of the community, I think more people who are successful, who have made it, as opposed to maybe moving to the suburbs, if you do do that, trying to make, make a real initiative to go back to urban communities and not just say, oh, I'm not dealing with those people. So I've kind of seen that, yeah. that attitude al among a lot of successful black men who who attain certain degrees or certain status where they feel like, oh, that's not my responsibility, but the government can't fix this. Exactly. Gonna, <laughs> programs won't necessarily fix it because of a multitude of different reasons. So it's gonna take a, r a real concerted effort by organizations like the 100 Black Men, Greater Sacramento Urban League and various other organizations to just go out in the community and raise money and, and, and other individuals who are complaining to donate time, resources, money on a consistent basis to try to fix this issue. So I think when it comes to the black on black crime, you have individuals fighting for what they feel like are the only things that are available to them. So if it's drugs, I spent a lot of time in Chicago myself, I have family there and you see virtually every block might have a different gang. Exactly. And you literally can't just walk around freely or you might get shot. So <laughs> that, that, that has a significant impact in terms yeah. of the mental health piece because if you feel less than, that has a biological response to it. Yeah. So if you feel crappy, to bit, put it bluntly, yeah. and you don't feel well, that's going to translate to your mental illness, to your mental health, mm -hmm. that's going to, you know, your dopamine, yeah. you know, your serotonin, all these different biological responses are affected in addition to the physical and the environmental factors. So the totality of circumstances is just that people are, are not getting, you know, and then when they do have access to health care, they're not pursuing a counselor. Exactly. Right? They're, you know, they might go get a physical, or if you have a broken limb, you, you go get that addressed, but you know, you might get looked at as, as being soft or weak. And, yeah. So again, I think it's going to take people who have made it out, making, just making that effort to, to be, make, make that impact on young people to the best of their abilities. And, and the government, frankly, has to, to, has to get a little bit more precise in how they distribute resources. So 
it's, it's going it's just team effort yeah it's, yeah it's a team effort and, and i do agree i know here in sacramento there's a lot of um agencies or organization that's geared towards their culture like they got a la familia mm -hmm. who is geared towards the spanish-speaking community they have um asian pacific center mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. geared towards the asian community and you know so i think it is important to have other people that you can identify with mm -hmm. you know because a lot of times people um, have trust issues and they really don't want to expose their issues to somebody they feel can't um, understand them you know and so I think that's what you're saying is definitely important and, and like you said Ramsey it definitely um, is going to take the uh, community but we we're, we're also having another issue going on and that and you kind of touched on that um, police brutality I know um, when I was in Chicago um, last year, um, I was pulled over by the police, and they, there were several cop cars pulled up. And you know, and when they they uh, approached me, I was very aware what was going on. You know, I know I'm a black male. I know these white police officers, so I responded in a way where um, I could take care of myself in a situation. Right. And so when they pulled me over, they was asking me um, where my um, ID license registration was. And I just, I was talking to them, I said, well, officer, I'm visiting from the state of California. My um, state ID and my car insurance is in the back, in my book bag. I said, do you want me to reach back there and get it? This I was talking to them. Mm -hmm. yes. Because at any moment, they could have, you know, I, I wouldn't be sitting here now, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so, make a long story short, to, I was it turned out good and so the officer said oh, I was a mistaken identity but you knew very well you was pulling me over because I was a, a young black man that's the reason why you was pulling me over you know but um, I think it's important also is to um, educate um, um, our um, brothers um, we, we had a, a, a pre-meeting the other day and, I, and some of the things that Joe was talking about was very very important and you know Joe you kind of touched on uh, being able to survive mm -hmm. you know kind of mm -hmm. talk about that because I think that's important um, for us to uh, be able to express to the to the you know young African-American males how to survive You're not just on the street but in other areas of our lives as well. Well, uh, I too am from Chicago. My first 30 <laughs> yeah. years, was, I was born and raised in Chicago. I'm a yeah. product of that uh, environment and thank God was able to get out of that environment. Yeah. But you know, you learn to survive and unfortunately, uh, many young black men have learned to survive the wrong way. Yes. Uh, and of course, they're, matter of fact, many of them are surviving quite well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, those of us who have managed to get out, uh, and when I say get out, I don't mean get out and stay out. I mean get out in terms of get out of the environment that is not healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and to learn, and I think there's no question in my mind that education is the thing that got me out. Mm -hmm. Because if I had stayed in Chicago, I would probably be dead or certainly in prison or in in, in the hospital or somewhere other than here. But it's a matter of survival. And when I say survival, I mean, if you grow up to be in an environment that is hostile, mm -hmm. you need to try to find a way through 100 Black Men or other organizations or an uncle or somebody who can be a positive influence yes. in your life mm -hmm. to help you to learn positive survival skills. Mm -hmm. One of the positive survival skills is education. Mm -hmm. Another one is literally common sense. Mm -hmm. You don't, I mean, you, you've you learned from a very young age that you don't huff and puff at the police. Mm -hmm. You don't huff and puff at gang members. Mm -hmm. In my case, you don't huff and puff at your mama. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You, so you don't huff and puff at people who you know can do you harm. Yeah. So, and it's really, and that will help you to survive. The other thing is being able to cope. Mm -hmm. There's going to be bad things or things that you don't want to happen in your life, but you just have to suck it up and try to learn from it and do better. And... If you're around healthy people and people who themselves are positive and have some good advice for you, you'll learn to, to, to realize that you pick your moments to fight. Mm -hmm. you, 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 don't, you, you don't have to have everything your way. Yes. <laughs> you, 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 you learn 
that life is not a bed of roses, yeah. mm -hmm. but hopefully if you do the right thing, most of the time, the right thing will, will, will come your way. Yeah. You treat people poorly, they will treat you poorly. Mm -hmm. You treat people with respect, most of the time, they will treat you with respect. Sometimes they won't, but that's the exception, generally speaking. So survival is, uh, is just a matter of, of learning how to get along in your environment, mm -hmm. learning how to grow, and the, things that, the bad things that happen to you, you learn from them. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they won't happen again. Yeah. And that's really what I mean about survival. Unfortunately, a lot of young men, because they have, in, in many cases, they have parents who don't want them to learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. So they do things for them mm -hmm. and they don't learn at all. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, the yes. objective, I think, is for them to, to learn. Yeah. They don't have to, you know, don't have to get beat up all the time. Mm -hmm. But a, a, f a few scuffles here and there, a few mm -hmm. bruises here and there, uh, are not Very all much. bad for them. Yeah. But yeah. again, it's a learning process. Yeah, and I, and I definitely agree with you on that. I think that some parents are uh, um, enablers to their children. Oh. Um, I have a, a brother that is <laughs> in his 30s, um, and he just refused to work. He, mm -hmm. All he do is drink, you know, and he has a daughter, and he just don't want to get a job. Very mm -hmm. smart, capable, but my mom, she just take the role of an enabler. She um, take care of him. She wash his clothes, she, you know, and me as being her um, son, yeah, of course I have a problem with that, mm -hmm. you know, but what can I do? That's her household, mm -hmm. you know, but... She know very well he couldn't stay with me uh, with that mentality, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's, um, that's very um, unfortunate, um, those type of things go on uh, where, where parents, um, you know, uh, enable their children. I have nephews in the same situation, you know. You know, my sister, I love her. She's a great mom, but I feel like sometimes she enable her kids. These are grown men. You know, if I can get out and work straight out of high school and go to college or whatever, so can they. I, I didn't have a good, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, but it, I guess it's just, you know, we're living in that culture. And because of that, some of them feel entitled. Yes. <laughs> they feel <laughs> entitled, you know. Um, but that's just one of many things that, you know, we need to address as a community. But I do want to touch back on um, the police brutality, because as you guys know, a lot of that is going on um, towards the African-American community. And what do you think we can do, or what advice as parents can we give our children when it comes to that? Because, you know, it, obviously it's a problem. Yes. You, know, yes. you know, it is a problem. And um, so what, 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 what advice can we give um, as parents or as mentors as, or as positive role models to these young black men, to these young black kids, um, um, to avoid that if possible? What role can we play in that to, to try to help them to escape that type of police brutality? Well, Jesse, let me just piggyback on what Joe was saying. Um, these um, we we have to we we have to build trust, you know, with, with the with the kids. Uh, but also, you mentioned that uh, we the second this next generation, like my daughter, she's forty plus, and and she enables her son to do things that she didn't allow her daughter to do. And her daughter, my granddaughter graduated from college, all A's, but the son, she enabled him, he doesn't have to do that. Uh, she made excuses for him. And that's no way to raise a child. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't raise you like that. She had the audacity to tell us, well, this, this is my son, you don't tell him what to do. I said, well, don't bring him over to my house anymore. <laughs> exactly. uh, but uh, they have to, what well, this, our, our, our offspring has gone left mm -hmm. a lot of times by enabling their kids to not get away with murder, but, well, since uh, I'm, I'm not going to raise my child the way you raised me, but you turned out great. Mm -hmm. And you allowing your daughter to go ahead and succeed, and your son, you're nurturing him. He's six foot two and, and, and almost 200 pounds, and he's in the eighth grade, and he can't 
hardly read, and mm -hmm. but he can play any game you want. Any you know, the technology now, PlayStations, whatever. He got the latest games. That's not education. That's that's we're not helping there. So uh, she's creating uh, him a way out, and I, I I find fault with that, and I can't do anything about it because it's her household. Mm -hmm. Her husband, her, her husband, my son-in-law, he's a sheriff, but he can't do anything because she runs the house. Oh, yeah. And I of... back <laughs> off because you're right, that is your house. But yeah. he comes to my house, Papa's going to, if he doesn't do what Papa says, you're going to have to take him home, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, she understands that. But we, 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 we have failed there for some reason. Uh, that happens in all families, not just uh, African-American families. Right. But we can reach them by caring for them. Mm -hmm. If we can, like I, my grandson, I try to chat with him, uh, man or boy, uh, you're going to encounter this and that. Uh, do you know how to act, you know, if you see an officer? Because mm -hmm. uh, your father's a sheriff, mm -hmm. but I'm sure you know, you know, uh, but he is a different individual at home but at, and then at work. But I do chat with them, and, and so you need to realize there are things that you can't do. You have to use common sense. Mm -hmm. You know what common sense is, right? You know what right and wrong is, right, yeah. son? And he said, uh-huh, yeah. But he he's caught up in, in the ideology that his mama going to take care of everything. But no, she's not, because she's, she's going to, you're going to have to leave one day. Yeah. Wow. And uh, common sense is what Joe was saying, is, is we have to teach them basic common sense yeah and that that's survival in itself yeah. you know right from wrong mm -hmm. but you try wrong because it looks good and sometimes it feels good but there's consequences for you know choosing the, the wrong against the right yeah. so we have to uh, work on that but building trust uh, with with people that are underprivileged or deprived of a father a single family home uh, they need trust, and we mentor, we try our best, you know, to reach the young people, uh, middle school, uh, John Stills and, 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 and Hartness. We try to reach those students with a little trust and, and showing up. If we say we're going to be there, we try to be there. Mm -hmm. If not, we send someone else. Because if we vanish out of their lives, that's, that, we're failing them. Mm -hmm. So uh, those survival skills helps them deal with uh, even in their communities, you know, black on black crime, but you know who not to let Joe say who to huff and puff at. Uh -huh. you, don't, you don't blow up, you know, yeah. <laughs> in front of someone that has authority. And you should know who's an authority. And it's yeah. our job uh, as parents and as mentors to let them know. Uh, you don't have to walk on eggshells, but you have to be respectful of authority and be respectful of yourself. Mm -hmm. And we try to encourage them to like themselves because a lot of individuals don't like themselves. Our well, I've encountered some that, uh, what's the matter, son? You, 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 you mad at the world? Mm -hmm. You know, you try to break through the shell mm -hmm. as mentors. We try to break through the shell and, and find out what it is that's causing them this grief or this, yeah. this shadow over their face. We want to encourage a better attitude in our, uh, in our young people. Yeah. Because they do have some issues that we didn't have, I didn't have when I was growing up. Yeah. They're, they're dealing with issues. I said, really? Yeah. That's okay, but that's a single fa single family home. Yeah. And I could, I see that, but I, I didn't live through it, but I, I've heard about it, I've seen it, and I thank God I didn't live through it. I mean, I, I, had, I had both parents, and my kids had both parents, uh, but still, I feel the need to reach back mm -hmm. and help because I, I know the state of, of the country, of the nation, and the world. Yeah. But uh, reaching back, encouraging, and, and, and building trust because they don't trust us, you know, because, you know, we're, we're the enemy a lot of times mm -hmm. to young people yeah. that's living in a single family home. Excuse me, because mama's always said, be careful, don't trust so and so. Yeah. It's hard to build trust, but we need to, we need to establish a, a trust base there with our mentees, so I don't want to go on, but I just, I, I, we have to reach back and we have to let them trust us and we can't vanish from their lives once we step in because that happens too much, mm -hmm. you know, in a single family home because a man would come in, two or three men might come in in that child's life, yeah. but we can't vanish out of their lives. We need to put an imprint there and say, okay, it's gonna, I'll be there. I'll, I won't flake on you. I'll be at your graduation. Yeah. I'll be at your ceremony. Yeah. And we have to show up. And th that's what they need yeah. uh, to encourage them to survive. So what, what do we, um, 
say to um, someone that is, you know, young and that is full of anger mm -hmm. and bitterness and hatred? Um, how do you, how do you, how would you approach that? Like, you know, because myself, I was <laughs> one of those um, people growing up where I had a lot of that in my heart. And it took a long time for me to trust people. I mean, anybody that know me, family members, you know, I didn't let people get too close to me because I felt like, you know, people were gonna hurt me, people didn't care about me. I really felt like that nobody loved me growing up. That's literally how I felt, you know? And um, so I had this wall up, but a lot of people couldn't tell because I, I masked it with me being um, joking and, and acting silly and stuff like that. You know, but what, how do you deal with um, people that is really hurting, that have real, real, real life issues? And I know you talked about, um, you know, really being there for them and stuff like that, but how do we handle the ones that just don't want our help? You know, because it, it really is something going on mentally up there. It mentally, yes. You know, that's, that's what's going on. Uh, I just briefly, I'll say that uh, they might need professional help. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes. uh, anything short of professional help, uh, for me personally, I think they need Jesus. Yeah. Oh, but yes. professional yes. help is what will help them to find out why they're so angry. Right. Yeah. Why? Uh, there's always a source of the mm -hmm. anger, yeah. and hopefully they can work through that yeah. with a professional and help them to get to a point of trusting yeah. and get to the point of realizing that uh, there's hope. Yeah. And I think they probably need professional help. Yeah. To kind of piggyback on what you were saying, professional help, I would say peer professional help is uh, what mm -hmm. may be needed is somebody mm -hmm. who knows exactly what's going on, who can be empathetic as opposed to sympathetic. Yeah. Um, I think that love and persistency with somebody who's experiencing all these different types of emotions is exactly what they need. You know, of course, you know, they're so used to people walking out, but you want to be persistent and you want to uh, continue uh, to try to make that imprint, mm -hmm. as he was saying. Um, so professional help, but peer professional help, someone who understands, someone who knows, I, I would say that's what that's the way to go about it. Okay. Well, I guess one last thing I'd add to that is when I was working as a drug counselor, we tried to work on two main things. Number one was the triggers. Mm -hmm. So what are your triggers in terms of not just using drugs, but anger uh, and, a, and the other negative um, characteristics somebody might exhibit? Then number two would be coping skills. Yeah. So building a positive coping skills, how do you, there's going to be something that triggers you to get angry or triggers yeah. you to want to use or triggers you to get depressed or triggers you to exhibit whatever type of conduct. So we worked on that and then coping skills would be talking to friends, taking yeah. a walk playing basketball or whatever other positive thing that you did. Sometimes it would be religion, yeah. some, whatever yes. you needed, kind of your higher power was what we emphasized. So what's your higher power? What keeps you balanced? What keeps you positive? What keeps you on track? Because everyone is going to deal with turmoil yeah. in, some, in some form. So it's just to be a matter of how you react to that. So those two things were, were critical. The triggers, what's triggering you and what's, how are you coping with stress or with just life as you know because we all have life stressors yeah every day so uh, you can't escape that so you have to find a way to deal with that so anger management is a thing that sometimes getting in a group a yeah. group setting 10 or 15 of your peers like you said led by someone who's going through that what's triggering you to get angry and hostile and breathing exercises yeah. and there's a lot yes. of different things that you can implement in somebody's treatment treatment plan to to help them and I think I guess to go back to the last topic in terms of the pr police brutality I think maybe if they collaborated with the community more in terms of if you encounter a young black man maybe you speak to them with a little bit more respect yeah so I know I've encountered several police several times where it was a mistaken identity yeah. and they didn't approach me in a in a professional manner yeah with a level of respect or courtesy was hey boy, kind of an attitude. Yeah. So I think if you approach someone, even if you think they're a criminal, if they're not hostile to you, I think a lot of times police can, maybe that's, that's a training issue yeah. in terms of how you deal with the public. Uh, so that, that would be something that I would, that I would think would be important.
Yeah. So. I also, I think, too, uh, and I know we're going to run out of time, um, also I think that uh, we need to try to um, teach them how to reshape their thinking. Because I know growing up, a lot of people think that um, other races or other cultures has um, an edge on them. But I know to a certain extent that may have some truth to it, but it should not stop you from moving forth and giving your best. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times when they experience some form of racism, mm -hmm. when, they, when they experience some form of rejection or kickback, that kind of put them, set them back, and they really don't have as much motivation. They just kind of feel like, oh, this is the way it is, this is the way it's gonna be, this is where the government is. But no, you, you have to keep pushing, you gotta keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, because I do believe that we are a culture that have a strong nature. We are survivors. We know how to survive. Yes, uh, we can be all the way to the top and come on down and we still know how to survive. Definitely. Maybe that's the way we're made, maybe that's the way we build, I don't know, but we know how to survive. And I think that we, we need to really try to teach the, the youth, especially, um, 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 how to really uh, move and navigate in what's going on today. We have a lot of young single parents too. Mm -hmm. I think yes. that's part of the problem. Yes. You know, they're not, they, they, you know, you got babies having babies. You know, how are you going to be 16 and 15 years old? You can't raise a child. You're still a child yourself. Right. You know, so a lot of that kind of adds, um, adds to the problem. Uh, but before we close, we're going to have a few more minutes. Who just want to just give some advice to um, some youth out there that may be hurting, that may be going through something? Just somebody, just kind of give, give some advice to somebody that potentially can be watching this program that may be hurting, that may be contemplating suicide or something. What advice can you give them, um, somebody right quick? I will say the first thing is don't keep it to yourself. Okay. okay. Sure. Let yeah. somebody else know about it talk about it find somebody who you can talk to who you trust okay. yes. and who will listen to you and who might move to the next step of getting you some help yeah yes I would have to say educate yourself you know be comfortable in your own skin you know yes. if you know your history if you look at your history especially african-american history you would see that you know we were we were kings and we were queens so yeah. you have to position yourself and think of the mindset that you are powerful and you hold the power um, that they're trying to take away from you. So um, just to be comfortable within yourself and uh, just like he said, go out and get free up. Don't be afraid to ask for it. That's the takeaway point that I would leave. Yeah, because there is a lot of resources in the community too. Um, and you know, it may not be strictly geared towards a specific culture, but um, especially in Sacramento County, we're definitely a diverse you know, mm -hmm. county. <laughs> so there's resources available. You know, you got the county of Sacramento, you got all type of places that you can get the help that you need if you're contemplating suicide, if you're depressed, or if you're being abused, or if you ain't got food, or if you're homeless, or things like that. Anything could, that can stop you from um, doing something that you'll later regret, um, there, there's definitely uh, help here um, in uh, Sacramento. Um, well, we are running out of time, and I just want to uh, thank everybody um, for coming on the show, and um, hopefully that somebody can watch this and get something uh, from this. And I do want to say I love this panel up here, and one of the reasons why I wanted to just have a, um, different ages of us up here uh, from different fields and, and stuff like that. I was going to go home and actually change clothes, but I didn't get a chance <laughs> because it's hot. But I'm kind of glad I didn't uh, because, you know, people tend to judge us off our appearance, you yeah. know. Um, and so I kind of was, you know, like, mm, yeah, it's hot. I, I could make it, but no, I'm not going to do it. So um, I'm, I'm thankful that you guys came on. I think it was a good Thanks show, too. Us. So um, that's it for our edition of Mental Health Matters. And I thank you for um, this edition of Mental Health Matters. If you have questions about the show or if you even want a copy of the show, please contact me at 916-366-4600. Thank you. When I think of where I've been Good times and the bad On a scale of one to ten Either way I'm glad 
Cause I'm not alone As I'm reaching for the phone Your voice is there, you really care You're my comfort zone Sometimes when I'm lost Crushed beneath the pain Though I can't afford the cost I just smile and play the game But there's a healing place Where I cannot pretend Your smiling face, your heart's embrace Heals me again So even when the storm is strong And I'm deaf to my own cry I faintly hear a distant song And I simply can't deny That I'm not alone Ten thousand times I've known My best bet is that first step for Trying to stand tall I'm haunted by the past With my back against that wall One thing is clear at last The kind of love you show to me Flows from an endless stream With shores so wide it won't subside My mind had never dreamed How I'm not Touch is much too much to let me roll. So even when the storm is strong and I'm deaf to my own cry, I faintly hear a distant song and I simply can't deny. Yeah.